Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the London School of Economics. I remember a, a friend of mine who, at an early stage in his life, had to introduce a very famous author. And uh, he sort of thought about this, and he got up and said, if I try to introduce the speaker, you will say, shut up, we know all about him. Tell us about you. Who the hell are you to be standing up here and introducing? And I, the, I mean, I'm in a very lucky position because all I have to say, hey, here is Nanda, and sit down, and you all know who he is and, and, and what he has done and so on. So it's utterly pointless uh, to, to, be, to be introducing somebody who is, uh, uh, who is uh, so well known. But just to put it in the context, this 2009 is witnessing an election in India in which the world is taking even greater notice than it did before. And it's not just the numbers, which are pretty staggering, 710 million voters, uh, things like that. But people are puzzled about the outcome. How can we have such an amazingly chaotic politics? How can one contemplate coalitions or whatever it is, 15, 20 parties, uh, caste, religion, uh, tribal divisions, and how does it all work? And what, what is it? How come India is this amazingly dynamic, successful entrepreneurial economy with lovely, shiny IT centers, especially the Infosys campus in Bangalore, and it's totally messy politics? And I've often been asked. Is this a, just a correlation or is it a causation? I mean, is one the cause of another or, you know, what is it? And I think one of the nicest things uh, in the last few years has been in India, the emergence of an amazingly talented, globally competitive, well-known class of business people. And after as Anandan says, after decades of treating business with contempt, sheerly out of ignorance of economics and of history, but I won't go into that, at last India has been able to take advantage of the enormous talent it has. And Nandan's book is also remarkable because normally businessmen are not supposed to write books about how to improve the country. That's a task of politicians. Uh, especially people who can recycle their father's and grandfather's ideas. Uh, uh, and so I think it's an absolutely thrilling moment to be able to introduce Nandan and his book, uh, in Imagining India Ideas for the New Century. And I, I have sat and throwed in front of a television uh, uh, screen for hours on end when Nandan has been educating almost all of India about his ideas. I've had a great pleasure, and I'm sure you are about to have that great pleasure. Nandan Nelakani. Uh, thank you very much, Meghdad, and it's, it's really a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here uh, at the LSE to speak on my book, and I'm thankful to all of you for coming here. Uh, I'll spend the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes talking about my book and what I, why I wrote this book and so forth. You know, for the last uh, several years, uh, my job at Infosys has been uh, to, well, you know, to be on the global arena, to meet people and talk about India, talk about Infosys. And invariably, uh, I used to be asked a lot of questions. They would ask me, why is it that you have so many billionaires now on the Forbes billionaire list. At the same time, you have the world's largest population of poor people. Why is it that you have such a beautiful campus in Infosys and such large slums? Why is it, on the one hand, you have this sophisticated IT outsourcing industry and so many children who have no education? And why is it that you seem to live in the 17th century and the 21st century at the same time? And these were questions that, you know, I, I, I really was not in a position to answer. So I would mumble something and try to sort of pass, pass on to something else. But people would always come back to this very persistent question. And then finally I said, let me figure out why it is the way it is. And so in some sense, this book is a voyage of discovery for me as to why India is the way it is. 
Now, there are many books on India. There are books uh, written by historians about Indian history, by economists about Indian economy, by sociologists about India's caste. But I felt that to true, true, true justice to India, one had to really cut across all these things. And I had the uh, you know, privilege of being an ignorant amateur and therefore could, didn't really have to worry about my academic reputation. So I had the choice of cutting across all these issues and uh, I also had a pretty good Rolodex which I had collected over the last 10 years so I could call up anyone on the planet and say can you help me understand these things. So I managed to interview about 126 people from around the world including people like Nick Stern and others here. And I basically assembled this book from those conversations because from each of those conversations with specialists of different kinds I began to understand different facets of what was happening in India. Also, when you write a book on India, you can write about events, which end up becoming a historical perspective. You can write about individuals and how they've impacted uh, society, and that ends up becoming biographies. I said, let me look at India through the prism of ideas. Because I felt that's really the right way to look at India, because when you have a vast, rambunctious democracy, which is very argumentative, which doesn't accept uh, you know, uh, distilled wisdom, which argues on every point, it's only when an idea changes and takes root and, and changes the thinking of a large number of people that things begin to happen. In other words, it's only when ideas get embedded, matured, rooted, that change happens. And therefore, I felt looking at India through the frame of ideas was probably the best way to look at India. The other reason I chose the frame of ideas was that ideas gave me a chance to explore the past because it, I could give you the history of how the idea evolved in in the Indian mind. It, it gave a way to explain the present and it also gave me an opportunity to extrapolate into the future and say how, how, how would the future look if, if we change the way we think about different things. And therefore it gave me a, a framework to look at the past, the current and the future. And when I looked at all these big ideas that were changing India, I found, because you know I'm an engineer and engineers spend their time looking at patterns of behavior, I found a pattern in these ideas. I found, for example, that there are some ideas that are responsible for India being where it is today. The reason why the country has become so much more vibrant, where there's so much more action, there's so much more innovation happening. And that the reason for that I could trace to very specific ideas that have changed in the Indian mind in the last 60 to 70 years. And I call these the ideas that have arrived, that have, that have made India to do what it is. And then I found a second set of ideas where there was no disagreement about those things in the sense that people, the elite, political parties of all persuasions believed in those second set of ideas, except they just couldn't get it done. And I call these the ideas that we need to implement. And then I found there were a third class of ideas where there was huge argument, where there was ideological disputes, where there were stalemates, and nothing was moving because everything was stuck in this huge argument. And I call these the ideas in contest, or the ideas that we argue about. And then I found that there are many ideas which have not been given enough thought or enough strategic thinking, but those ideas are equally important as India looks at its future. And therefore, perhaps it may be worthwhile to actually speculate on these ideas which have not really matured or germinated in the Indian mind, but which could be thought about as things that we should think about as we move forward. And I call these the ideas that we need to anticipate. And therefore, essentially, it's looking at all the ideas of India, but looking at them in terms of which ones have already arrived, which ones have been agreed but not implemented, which ones we argue about, and which ones we need to anticipate. Now, what are these ideas which, are, which, which have arrived? What, is that, what are those ideas? And to understand the full import of the impact of these ideas, we have to understand what's happening in India versus what was happening in India 40 years back. In the 1960s, India was an economy that was growing at 3.5% a year. This 3.5% a year rate of growth was popularly called as the Hindu rate of growth. It was believed, it was ordained by God that India can only grow at 3.5%. It can't grow lower, it can't grow faster. It was very much uh, sort of, uh, you know, its destiny. And when India's population was growing at 3.5%, India's economy was growing at 3.5%, its population was growing at 2% in the 1960s. So all of you quantity types know that when the economy grows at 3.5% and the, and the population grows at 2%, it takes 45 years 
for the per capita income to double. In other words, if the average income in the society is $1,000, it takes 45 years for it to reach $2,000. In 2008, India is growing or was growing at 8 to 9 percent. And even today, in the worst of the global crisis, it's growing at 6 percent. And I have no doubt that once the economic recovery happens, it can go back to 6 to 8 percent growth. So when it, and at the same time, over time, because the population re, uh, growth rate has slowed down, the population is growing at 1.5 percent. So when the economy grows at 8 to 9 percent and the population grows at 1.5 percent, per capita incomes double every 10 years. And therefore, something which was taking 40 years to happen is now taking 10 years to happen. In other words, it is a kind of a fast forwarding. It's like a car which is traveling at 25 miles an hour, suddenly going at 100 miles an hour. And therefore, there's a fundamental shift in the pace of change. And we must understand that this is a very fundamental shift which is happening, which you will notice if you go every year. My friend Richard goes every year. Every year, he sees something changing there. And therefore, India is now reaching this acceleration. Now, what is the reason for this acceleration? I think there are six reasons, or six ideas, which are responsible for that. First, I think there's a huge change in the mindset of Indians towards its own population. Because at a time in India when we thought our population was a burden, a liability, and so on and so forth. Today, very differently, India thinks of its population as human capital. In other words, we are in our mindset, we have gone from seeing a population as a liability to a population as an asset. And this belief in our human capital is a very fundamental change. Because when you start thinking of your people as human capital, then you start trying to figure out how best you can harness the dividend of your human capital. And human capital or people can only be, uh, you know, contribute if they are healthy if they are skills, if they are educated, if they have roads to go to work and to school, if they have lights to study at night, and if there are jobs that are created. In other words, unless you create an environment where people are healthy, happy, productive, they are not really going to be very useful. And therefore, when you start thinking of your people as human capital, you start saying, what do I need to do to really make this human capital productive? And this is a very fundamental change in the Indian mind. This change in the Indian mind is accompanied by another unique factor, which is that India is entering a phase of its demographic dividend. Now, what is this demographic dividend which all you economists talk about? In simple terms, a demographic dividend is a time in a country's history when the bulk of its population is of a working age. Because what happens is a, a population which has, which has high birth rates, as the birth rates start slowing down, it creates a bubble where the, the number of new, new young people being born reduces, there are less old people, and the bulk of the population is in the age group of 15 to 65. And this can go on for 30, 40 years. And when you have this demographic dividend, which typically comes just once in the life of a country, you have what is called as a very low dependency ratio, which means the number of people working is far more than the number of people to be supported. Now, the opposite happens when an economy ages. When an economy starts aging, then the number of people to be supported is often much more than the number of people working. And as you have seen, this is happening in many countries in Europe and in Japan particularly. And that's a very different situation. But India is at a point when it is enjoying its demographic dividend. And in fact, at, at, a, at the point in this demographic dividend, India will have a dependency of four, or, or one, one by four, which is saying that for every one person who has to be supported, four people are working. This is a huge, huge asset. And why the demographic dividend is important is when you have such a high number of working people, there are more people working, there are more people saving, there are, there are more savings, and therefore there's more money to invest. More investment means more, more, more productivity, and more economic growth, and so on and so forth. So if you have this demographic dividend, it also creates a virtuous cycle and this has been seen in many parts of the world when, you know, for example, the United States had a baby boom after the Second World War, which created a demographic dividend. Japan had one too at the same time. Ireland had a demographic dividend when they introduced contraception and so on and so forth. So different things, you know, it can happen because of social change, it can happen because of higher literacy, it can happen because of better health care, because as, 
as 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 families start realizing that they they you know in the in in, in the days when you have high infant mortality you have a lot lot more babies to you know to to take care of any deaths but as the infant mortality goes down then you have less babies so all these things contribute to this demographic dividend but what is even more important is that india is the only country or the only major country which is going to have a demographic dividend in other words india is going to be the only young country in an aging world so that makes the demographic dividend even more strategic or even more compelling now this again has a reason for that because 30 years back china and india had broadly the same parameters of its demographics in the sense that both were typically about the same size and both in their own way were trying to implement a, a family planning program except that in china it was done through the one child policy which mandated that you have only one child in a family in india it was done in our usual inept manner and it wasn't very successful the only time that india actually tried to do coercive family planning was in the period of indira gandhi's rule called the emergency between july or june of 1975 to march of 1977 when her ambitious son went on this program of sterilization and other coercive methods of family planning unfortunately when there was an election in march of 1977 that government were lost very badly and therefore indian politicians came to a very quick conclusion that family planning is political suicide <laughs> and they went to the extent of even renaming the department of family planning to the department of family welfare as a result india after that has never had any occasion to really do coercive planning Now what happened was when the chinese implemented the one child policy they were essentially able to by a massive feat of social engineering accelerate their demographic dividend because you had a very steep fall and in the last 30 years or now right now up to maybe 2015 china enjoys its demographic dividend but china's demographic dividend is coming to an end and india's demographic dividend is beginning because india's birth rate dropped for a more gradual in a more organic way as literacy went up as health improved as families went to cities and so on and so forth so though the two countries were the same in terms of the population curves 30 years back we have a unique situation where china is almost fully expensing its demographic dividend and by 2015 it is going to start aging but india is going to now enjoy its demographic dividend in the next 30 years in fact china will have 400 million old people because the same dynamic which brought rapid reduction in birth rates also will cause rapid aging and other ch challenges of pensions and so forth so fundamentally india is in a unique position it is having a demographic dividend it is the only country having it and therefore it's really a special time but a demographic dividend as i explained earlier is only as good as the investment you make in your people because if you invest in them if you have health and education and all this good stuff you have this young dynamic aspirational population which can contribute to the economy on the other hand if you have a demographic dividend and people are not educated or they don't have the skills to work if there are no jobs then the same demographic dividend can go the other way because you'll have this huge young population whose aspirations have been unleashed by television by the internet by the by twitter all the stuff and they have no way to go and therefore if you unleash these aspirations and you're not able to fulfill them and if you thwart them then the same young people who were full of this gusto will now turn disgruntled resentful violent and divisive and therefore a demographic dividend if it is not used appropriately can become a demographic disaster and that's the challenge that india has it it has structurally not because somebody planned it but largely due to serendipity it has a unique position where is the only young country in an aging world is the only country having a demographic dividend if it cashes in on the demographic dividend it has many many years of successful uh, you know prosperity but if it doesn't do its thing right it can go the other way and that's the real the hopes and the choice that we have at this at this moment so the first big idea is really the fact that indians have started seeing the population as human capital as a positive thing the second big thing i believe is the change in the indian mind towards the indian entrepreneur and india has had a very contentious relationship with entrepreneurs partly because people saw 
you know, after India got its independence, partly the overall influence of uh, socialistic thought and partly because we got independence from an, an empire which was earlier a company and therefore there was a lot of negativity about business and only now that has changed and therefore a society has changed and has gone from being suspicious about entrepreneurs to becoming much more appreciative entrepreneurs. At the same time, the Indian entrepreneur has also changed. I call that phenomenon as from Bombay plan to Bombay club to Bombay house. Now what do I mean by that? In 1944, the leading businessmen of the day, the J.R.D. Tata, G.D. Birla, Purushottam Das Thakur Das, John Mathai, all these people got together and said, how should we look at a new independent India? And they came and they prepared a document which is known as the Bombay Plan. And the Bombay Plan actually said that the state must have a very large role in the economy that private capital is not going to be adequate to build the new India, so the state must spend on public infrastructure and all that, and really uh, private capital will not be able to. In other words, the 1944 B Bombay plan actually conceded that the state must have a large role. It's not just you know, Nehru saying it should have a role. Even the businessmen of the day said that the state must have a large role. And that ultimately led to a lot of unintended consequences and planning and licensing and all this stuff. And then similarly, in 1991, when India got its, independent, uh, got its economic sort of uh, freedoms after the reforms of 91, another group of businessmen met in a hotel in Bombay, and that was called as the Bombay Club. And the Bombay Club said, look, you know, for the last 40 years, we have lived in this protected environment, and, you know, we have, you know, we, 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 you know suddenly you guys are opening up the economy, and all these foreigners will come, and they'll buy us up, and they'll... They'll, they'll, you know, all these the multinationals will come and, you know, Indian national capitalists will go out of business. So they said we need 40 more years to become more efficient. So don't do all this stuff about economic reforms because it will, you know, jeopardize our very future and every country protects its national capitalists and so please protect us. And therefore the businessmen of 1992 were protectionists. They were scared of global competition. They were scared of the impact of foreign companies, foreign capital. Today, it is the spirit of Bombay House. Now what is Bombay House? Bombay House is the capital building of the Tatas. The Tatas operate from Bombay House. And today for the Tatas, 50% of their revenue is outside India. They have bought Chorus, they have bought JLR, they have bought hotels all over the place, they have software everywhere. And they believe in global competition, they believe in globalization, they're launching the Nano, they're, they're very, they welcome competition. And that in some sense, the metaphor of the change in the mindset of the Indian businessman from the businessmen of the Bombay Plan of 1944, who wanted a large role for the state, to the businessmen of 1992 Bombay Club, who wanted protectionism, to the businessmen of Bombay House, who is ready and fearless about global competition. And this change in the mindset of the Indian entrepreneur is the second big reason for India's dyna dynamism and vitality today. The third big thing is the change in India's thinking about technology and automation. In the 60s, India thought of technology as something forbidding, something that was, you know, they called computers as job-eating machines. Even today, some, I think somebody from the Samajwadi has said that, but anyway, this was much more prevalent in the 1960s. Uh, and computers are supposed to be job-eating machines. And as late as 1980s, the, when the Reserve Bank, which is like the Central Bank of India, came out with a report on bank automation, they didn't use the word computers. They called them ledger posting machines. <laughs> and they believed they would fool the unions by calling them ledger posting machines. And when they had to come out with a report on more powerful versions of these machines, they called them advanced ledger posting machines. <laughs> so as late as 1987, we dare not utter the name of, you know, what is that, Voldemort, huh? who's the guy in... That book? Yeah, it's like that. We didn't want to utter the word computers. We call them ledger posting machines. And so there was a fundamental unwillingness to accept technology, computers, and all that stuff. Today, we live in a country where India sells anywhere from 8 to 10 million mobile phones a month. 99% of these mobile phones are prepaid, which means the people are so poor they don't even have a credit history. And 40% of the mobile phones the average recharge is less than 10 rupees. 
And for those people, that little mobile phone with the computer inside is a huge instrument of empowerment. And therefore, in the Indian mind, technology has gone from something which is forbidding, something which is intimidating, something which destroys jobs, to something which is empowering and provides access. And that's a huge shift in the Indian mind. And technology has played a big role in that. The fourth big thing is the Indian view of English. Now, English, as you know, in India began as a language of outsourcing. I'm sure you know that, right? <laughs> because the British East India Company in the early part of the 19th century found it was too expensive to bring expatriate British to work in India and said, maybe we should teach these Indians English so they can work for us cheaper in India. <laughs> so they decided to teach them English. However, when they taught the Indians English, there were a couple of unintended consequences. <laughs> the first was that Indians from different parts of India who spoke different languages at home learned to speak to each other. In other words, the Bengali in Calcutta could speak to the Tamilian in Chennai who could speak to the Punjabi in Lahore. So they were able to create a pan-Indian language of speech. The secondly, when they taught the Indians English, they started reading English literature and in English philosophy, and they read about all this liberty and all this stuff. <laughs> so they said, you know, you guys are writing all this stuff about liberty and fraternity and all this. Why can't we have the same? And therefore, it created the basis, the genesis for Indian, you know, the political parties like the Congress, which fought for Indian independence. So English had these in unintended consequences, except that when we came to 1947, they said, look, here is a new independent country, and we are, you know, removing the yokes of imperialism. How can we use their language? You know, it's, it, it sounds ridiculous that we should be using their language, because it's like keeping them back. And therefore, we had many national languages, and and Hindi was supposed to be the, like, the official link language all around. There was only one problem, that Indians spoke hundreds of languages, and there are a lot of these guys who didn't know Hindi, especially the Tamilians from Chennai who said, we can't make this Hindi the national language, or language because then we'll, we'll, get, we'll lose out, because we don't know how to speak this stuff. So they agreed on a deal where they said they'll keep Hindi for 15 more years, from 1950 to 1965, Temporary deal, accommodation, in 65, we'll do all this Hindi stuff. But 65 came along and the Tamilians said, still not learn English. <laughs> uh, Hindi, I mean. They had not learned Hindi. And therefore, this time they became violent. They started burning themselves. And there were a lot of self-immolations in, in, in Madras in the, in the mid-60s. And actually, the DMK won the first election in Tamil Nadu in 1967 to the first time that a non-Congress party won an election in the South, well, not the first, in, in Tamil Nadu, on an anti-Hindi platform. And again, it became so messy and so violent and so much of this self-immolation, all that, they said, okay, forget it, we'll keep Hindi and English, so, you know, both, both state. And English officially became a national link language, and they came out with some convoluted three-language formula and all that to keep it going. And then outsourcing again became interesting. Are you in the Please. Whoever has got the mobile, please switch off or go. He's clearly using his mobile phone well. So anyway, so uh, the so Eng then outsourcing came back, and suddenly English became again aspirational. And now everybody wants to learn English. Even the poor are saying, I you know I didn't learn English, but I want my children to learn English. So English has come full circle, and now it has become a language of aspiration. So from a language of the foreigner, from a language to be ex excluded, it's now become a language of aspiration. So that is the other big change that has happened in India. And then I think the way Indians thought of globalization has changed. We thought of globalization as something negative because globalization and imperialism were the same things. But today the Indians are much more comfortable, our companies are comfortable going abroad, our students are comfortable coming abroad, our tourists are comfortable going out, our workers want to go and work you know, all over the world. So Indians are a lot more comfortable with globalization and the sixth big thing, I think, is the fact that democracy has become embedded in India. That democracy in 1947 was an elite concept of a few people based on a certain vision and idealism. But today, democracy is very much in the Indian bloodstream. And the elections that uh, Meghnath was talking about is the world's largest election, 700 million people voting over five sessions, one million voting machines, a huge spectacle that's going to happen is actually happening. 
And I believe all these six things are really responsible for why India is where it is. The fact that our view of, demo of our demographics, our view of population has gone from seeing it as a liability to human capital, the fact that our entrepreneurs have become globally competitive, the fact that technology has become empowering, the fact that English is now a language of aspiration, the fact that India is comfortable with globalization, and the fact that democracy is deeply embedded in our society, because that's creating choice and, and an open society. So these six things, I believe, are responsible for this, all this uh, activity and, 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 and dynamism that you see. Now, so far, it sounds like the India shining BJP you know, sort of program of 2004. So what are the problems in all this? And then I come to the second part of what I'm saying, which is the ideas which I believe have arrived but not implement, uh, have, 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 have been agreed but not implemented. What are those ideas? One is primary education. I think for the first time, we have now accepted that we have to do something about primary education because we have talked about this primary education for a long time, but nothing much happened about it. But there's been a long convoluted history, but for the first time now, on the one hand, the people want education because one of the things that economic reforms did was expose people the economic cost of not being educated. And people have not connected this well because they think of economic reforms only in economic terms. But in aspirational terms, for the first time, people realized if they don't have education, then they're going to be shut out of the income game. And therefore, the poor have very clear that their children will get educated. So there's a huge change in the mentality and mindset on education. At the same time, the state is spending money on education. You know, we have programs called the Sarvashiksha Abhiyan and others where we have a 3% cess on our taxes only for the purpose of primary and secondary education. Uh, India's annual tax collection is about 500,000 crores, which is about $100 billion. So every year, $3 billion is straight away taken off the top and put into education. So both the money is coming in, as well as the desire is there. Unfortunately, in all these years when we neglected education, all the schools had gone to seed. And you had all these government schools, but no teachers coming to work. And therefore, the poor have realized that too, that the government schools are not up to speed. So they are now going to private schools. If you go to any urban city, any city in India, Bombay or Delhi or Bangalore, more than 50% of the children in slums go to private schools. Now these are not private schools, this is not Eton or Harrow or something. <laughs> these are one room tenements, mom and pop operation where the fees are very low. And, but even then the poor are saying even those schools are better than the government schools. Even in rural India, 22% of children now go to private schools. And therefore, people are saying, if the public schools don't deliver, we'll just send them to private schools, we'll, we'll do the sacrifices, and we'll send them to private schools. But fundamentally, education is now, you know, the, 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 boat has, the, sort of the boat has left the harbor. It'll take many years to make it happen. There's a lot of issues of efficiency and all that. But fundamentally, this is something which will get cracked in the next decade or so. The second big thing is infrastructure. Again, for many years, we didn't build any infrastructure. The, after independence, the first major infrastructure project was only the 1990s when we built the Konkan Railway. Till then, there were no major infrastructure projects. And now infrastructure has become very, very compelling. Everybody wants infrastructure. It is reflected in our political slogans. In, in the 1970s, our political slogan was Roti, Kapda, Makan, food, clothing, and shelter. Today's political slogan is Bijli, Sadak, Pani water, power, and roads. It shows how in the minds of our political system, how infrastructure has now become very important. In today's election, it's about broadband for all. Again, it's about infrastructure. So fundamentally, I think infrastructure, again, is something which will happen. It will take many years to happen, but it is something which there's no argument. No matter which combination of parties comes to power on May 16th, infrastructure will go on. The third big thing is urbanization. And India has had a very complex relationship with urbanization. And I believe there are two reasons for that. Part of it was the Gandhian view that India lives in its villages. And, you know, villages were the romantic republics and uh, Panchayat Raj and all that stuff. And therefore, in the Gandhian view, cities were not really a great place to go. The second reason why cities got a bad rap in, in independent India was cities were where the British ruled from. And all the, all the big cities were all essentially British cities. And if you went to Delhi, you saw Lutyens buildings. And therefore, for an independent nation, urban India reminded them of the British rule. In fact, Nehru said, New Delhi is a very un-Indian city. Every day he went to work in Lutyens buildings. And therefore, because of these two things, India had a very, very tentative relationship with its cities. And in its politics, in the constitution, cities have, don't even have recognition. 
You only have center and state. There's no recognition for cities. And therefore, over time, cities became fugitive, cities became marginalized, they lost political power, they lost financial power, and they lost capacity to run cities. And therefore, cities went down the tube. But today, economic reforms have shown us that cities are very important, because cities are where people get together, cities are where you have economic activity, cities are engines of productivity, cities are engines of innovation, cities are centers of excellence. And this is a huge change in the mindset, and finally, you know, for the last five years, for the first time, we are spending billions of dollars in trying to improve our cities. Again, this is going to take a long time, but fundamentally, that mindset has changed, and now cities are accepted as good things. And the other reason why cities are important is that in this election, for the first time, you're having an election after a delimitation where all the constituencies have been redrawn in every state based upon the population, and the number of urban seats is 120 out of 543 which means there are many more MPs who are going to come from cities now, and therefore the demand for improving cities is going to go up. Therefore, again, urbanization is something which is going to happen. And the fourth idea, which I think is going to happen anyway, is the idea that India should be a single market. Because India is not a single market. Every state has their own rules, their own taxes. Every time you try to move goods from one state to another state, there are a whole host of bureaucratic, bureaucratic problems. But now, because when you didn't have a market, why did you need a single market? So only when you have a market, you suddenly realize that the whole thing is not a single market, and therefore now single markets are happening. And therefore these four ideas, the notion that cities are important, the importance of infrastructure, the importance of primary education, and the importance of single markets are ideas which I believe have been accepted. It's just a matter of getting it done. But I can, I'm quite sure that for these four ideas, it doesn't really matter what political constellation comes into power, because these will happen because everybody believes in it. But what is it then we argue about? I think uh, we argue a lot about things, but the three big ideas which I think are holding us back on the argument side is one about higher education. You know, India is still not go clear about higher education. That's why all of you come here to study. <laughs> 200,000 Indians study abroad. And therefore, because we have not liberalized our higher education, we still have a huge set of constraints and regulations on education, who can start a university, what they can teach, how much they can teach, how much they can charge fees, how much they can pay their faculty, how much they can, you know, all that. It's completely regulated. And we have no policy on allowing foreign universities, we have no policy on allowing private universities. So it's a very, very big argument which is waiting to be opened up. And that's a big challenge that India has, that we haven't really opened up our higher education. And, we are, and it's going to be a huge challenge because you're going to have all these young people going to school and higher secondary school, and there won't be enough colleges and universities to, to deal with that. And that's a big challenge that we have. The second big challenge is on our labor reforms because fundamentally, because we have a, a set of very antiquated labor laws, most businesses outsource it to informal labor, and therefore we have a situation where 93% of Indian labor is in the unorganized sector. So you have this very barbell effect where you have 93% of employees who have no rights and are the first to get hurt when there's an economic slowdown, and you have some 2% who are in this highly unionized category who cannot just, you know, can, you can do nothing about them. And we have created this very unequal system, and this again has been a holy cow for many years, but that again is something we need to really reform to create an equitable balance between the rights of employees and the rights of employers. But that's the only way you're going to create formal sector jobs which are required to really address this demographic dividend. And the third big argument is about affirmative action. How do you handle the whole issue of social exclusion? How do you make sure that people who have been left out get a chance, a leg up in this society? Is it through reservations? Is it through affirmative action? Is it through a point system? You know, all those uh, reservations and arguments about labor reforms are the three big ideas whose arguments are essentially holding up the progress of India. Now, if India is able to take these six ideas which are responsible for its current dynamism, if it's able to implement what there is no argument about, like <coughs> primary education and cities and so forth, and if it's able to resolve these arguments about a higher education and labor and so on, it has the potential for many, many years of economic growth which can take it forward because all the other factors are in place, the young population, the high savings and all that. But then when you start doing that, you come to what I call the challenges of prosperity. What do you do? When, when a country becomes, um, uh, start getting rich. Because then you, then you have to go around and look around the world, what's happening elsewhere? And we have to make sure we don't make the same mistakes. Now what are those things? First, I believe it's about what happens when a young population starts aging. Because we have seen what aging happens in, in other countries. It, the cost of healthcare go up as is happening around the world. The cost of pensions go up 
because if you have something like social security and pensions, then <coughs> as you have an aging population, the burden of that on the state goes up. Today in the United States, the combined unfunded liability of social security, Medicare, Mediclaim is over $50 trillion, they, they say. So fundamentally, you create all these unsustainable entitlements. And it's happening here too. And therefore, is there a way, when a population is young, to design its health strategy, to design its pension strategy, so it does not create long-term challenges? And that's very important. And here, we can look at what's happening elsewhere to make sure that we don't repeat the same mistakes. And I talk about that, that strategy in my book. Similarly, the other big challenge is environment and energy. Because when the Western development happened, they hadn't heard of something called global warming. So, you know, development happened and they burnt up all this coal and oil and all this stuff. But now with all this new challenge of global warming, which is a fundamental challenge. And to give you a sense of the challenge, now today, the uh, per capita consumption of CO2 or the per capita emission of greenhouse gas is very different in the world. In the US, it's 20 tons per person per year. In Europe, it's 12 to 14 tons. In China, it's four tons per year. In India, it's two tons per year. But this is, even this level of CO2 emission is increasing the greenhouse gas in the, in the, in the world. And when industrial progress began in the 1850s, the total greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is about 280 parts per million. Today, it's at about 430 parts per million. In other words, it's gone up by 150 parts per million, essentially by industrial activity in the rich countries. And all these guys who meet the IPCC and all these guys, and, and Nick and all these guys, they say that if we go beyond 430 parts per million, then we are going to reach unsustainable levels of global warming, which means approximately half the reservoir of, of this planet has already been consumed by, by the rich countries. And if we are really going to stabilize this greenhouse gas, it will require it to stabilize at about 20 gigatons per year. Now in 2050, if the world population is going to be about 9 billion, that comes to about two, two and a half tons per person per year which is one-tenth of what the Americans now have. So fundamentally, if India will have to come out with a different paradigm to make sure that we are able to survive in this manner, because historically, there has been a linear growth between greenhouse gas consumption and income growth. Income grows, energy consumption grows, greenhouse gas emission grows. Now, if India is to grow at 8% a year and double every 10 years, but in now in 2050, its per capita income will go up 16 times. There's no way it's per capita greenhouse gas can go up 16 times. And therefore, fundamentally, it will have to think of a different paradigm of dealing with energy which is not there yet, which is you know, the so-called post-carbon economy. And it has to do it right now. It, sh you know, it, it shouldn't go and build 30, 100, 300 coal plants for the next 20 years and then say, oh, this, we can't go this way and go somewhere else. You can do it right now by building a whole new model. And therefore, India has the opportunity to rethink its energy way, the way it looks at carbon and post-carbon, and the way it looks at environment. Because again, if you're going to have a billion people whose income is going to go up 16 times, the kind of environmental pressure of that, if it's done in the old-fashioned way, is going to be enormous. It's going to be crippling. And therefore, you have to rethink what, what does that income growth mean in terms of lifestyle and so forth. So fundamentally, my point about anticipating India is, is understanding that in the rest of the world, it's facing challenges of uh, energy, of environment, of health, of pensions and saying, let us anticipate this thing. There's no need to repeat the mistakes that the rich countries have done, but actually factor in these learnings, look in the rear view mirror, and figure out a different way of doing these things. And that's really what the last part is all about. So fundamentally, I would say that India is at this strategic opportunity. It is enjoying a demographic dividend. It's the only young country in an aging world. It has the potential to leverage that, to create a prosperous country which addresses the challenge of, of poverty and population, or if it doesn't do the right things, it, it could f go further into this whole maelstrom of uh, divisiveness and the choice that India has to make so that it can really be the country for the 21st century. Thank you very much. Danny Kwa, uh, who's a professor of economics at LSE and has done many imaginative things, including uh, talked about the weightless economy. 
and many other good ideas he's going to be discussing. Danny. <coughs> thank you, Magnan, and thank you, Nandan, for a wonderful lecture and presentation. Um, this is an exciting book that Nandan has presented to us. In his lecture this evening, he has gone through it in three parts. He has told us about the past, why India since 1991 has broken away from the Hindu rate of growth. He's given us the six critical ideas that has allowed that to happen. He's then talked about the present, what the potential problems and holdups are that might derail further progress. And then he's taken us to a view of the future. He talks about the environment and, and energy issues, and he's told us how India, at this exciting stage of its economic progress, can, as it were, stand forwards in time and look back through the rearview mirror at the present, through looking at what's happening in other countries and India ga gaining lessons from that so that it does not repeat the mistakes that other countries have made. While the book obviously tackles an important substantive issue, it is also a book full of rich ideas. It is an ideas-based book, as the subtitle in the cover, on the cover page suggests to you. So I stand before you today to try and discuss these ideas, but it is not just an academic discussion that you go into with Nandan Nilekani. I was fortunate enough to first meet Nandan at the Davos World Economic Forum some years back. And even in that crowd, or perhaps especially in that crowd, it only takes 30 seconds conversation with Nandan to realize that this is a person for whom ideas are just grist so that when the rubber hits the road, he makes those ideas materialize. He makes them happen. He's taken an idea about economic performance, separation of production across vast distances in space and in time, and he's created an entire global industry out of that. He makes ideas happen. So just a gentle warning, when you ask questions afterwards in the Q&A session, please be very careful what you say. <laughs> this book is especially important, not just in its vision of a brilliant entrepreneur. It deals with India. The world now has only about six and a half billion people. There are only two countries on earth that have more than a billion people each. India is one of them. These two countries are the only ones on the planet on which physical movements day to day and economic developments month to month are directly observable by the naked eye from outer space. These two countries also happen to be the fastest growing entities on this planet, reaching the kinds of growth rates that you typically saw before just on chemical crystals. These dramatic increases in income, in productivity, in economic performance since 1991 in India, matching China's, has perceptibly moved the world's center of economic gravity eastwards, something that a Goldman Sachs report on the so-called BRICS economies uh, uh, put down for many of us who were not yet aware of what was going on. Situate India, therefore, in the global economy. The third, largest, the third large factor that sits today to concern us is the global recession. Is this the worst economic crisis in the last century? And if so, what place do the juggernauts, the Indias and Chinas, the two billion people economies play in this? And how do Nandan's ideas and how economic growth will continue to take us forwards. Have to, what do these ideas have to say about how the world economy will continue to perform? Well, here's an interesting fact. Nandan mentioned that India is an economy that on average sells eight million cell phones a month, or licenses out eight million cell phones a month. Okay, eight million cell phones a month on contract prepaid basis because a lot of this goes to people 
who do not have a credit history that allows them to put this on a credit card. Well, the fact is that January this year, in the midst of the largest global economic downturn for the last century, new cell phone subscriptions in India reached a record of 11 million, almost 50% higher than on average. How is this possible? Well, rural customers in India who are now beginning to see traction from the kinds of economic growth that Nandan has described for you, do not typically own land or hold extensive financial portfolios of CDOs and CDSs and mortgage-backed securities. They've been entirely unaffected by plunging stock markets and real estate prices. They continue to see benefits from digital mobile telecommunications. That is the picture that Nandan has presented for you of India and of the developing world more generally. It is a people-oriented view of economic development. It is how you get wider participation for people from rural areas, from the people living in slums who are actively seeking for their children primary education to get a foothold on the global economy. He's presented a vision for you of widening access to resources so that through appropriate markets, through appropriate competition, we get innovation and widen participation. And most of all, Nandan has presented for you a fervent belief in science and technology as the way forwards. If this were less serious an occasion, I would accuse him of presenting to you the solo neoclassical growth model driven by population with advances derived from progress in science and technology. That's a tried, true, tested model of economic progress, and we see its manifestation now in billion people economies around the world. So Nandan, thank you very much for that. Now, uh, we have an opportunity to ask uh, London uh, some questions. Now, I'm, this is when I get into my, my hyper mode. Uh, first of all, we shall use the House of Lords uh, tradition that everything has to begin with, does the speaker agree or not agree that? And the question. Don't want a summary of what he said. Don't want a summary of what you think. Uh, even a short one. I want questions, and only one question because equity demands that as many people get chance to ask questions as possible. Okay, now, that person there, and then that person there. Okay, come on, yeah. Would you agree that one of the main reasons that these labor, economic, educational forms are going to take so many years is your deteriorating politics the end of Congress's dominance since 1977, the proliferation of regional parties, and the increasingly messy coalitions which can't take decisions. Okay. Next. Okay, he's going to read his way. <laughs> this, 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 House of Lords should this, take five this, questions this at a time. managers are difficult to manage. In the House of Lords, you take five questions at one time? Well, yes, I'll tell you about that <laughs> later on, yes. No, clearly, I mean, I mean, in this uh, picture I, 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 I paint, uh, you're right in saying that the politics of India is suspiciously absent. And, and, and my view is that uh, that is going to be chaotic. I think you're right in saying that uh, we're going to see increasingly fractious coalitions, a uh, lot more regional parties, caste-based parties. But that's why I believe that the power of ideas is even more important because, as I said, on ideas, once they have been broadly accepted, then it doesn't matter whether we have a five-party coalition or a 500-party coalition. I mean, uh, to give an example on primary education, the, f the, the big move on primary education finally culminated in something called the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, which was announced by the previous government under Vajpayee in about 2000. And when the new government of the UPA came in 2004, they didn't abandon that. They actually strengthened that by putting a tax uh, for that and gave it more money. So once you have a deep-rooted idea like that, then it doesn't matter 
what the political economy because that will happen or even urbanization you know the government has a 10 billion dollar program for urbanization every party every state has signed up for reforms whether it's run by the bjp in gujarat by the communists in west bengal or by the congress in 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 andhra pradesh and that's the whole point that if these ideas can be embedded then that becomes a safety net while the politics will become more more uh, uh, more difficult hopefully these things will drive it better i mean it's i mean nobody's saying it's, it's everything's going to happen the way i say it is my only point is that it's plausible that there's this huge opportunity and if you think strategically we can actually get there yeah there's somebody here that has, yeah hi uh, does the speaker agree or disagree that there are uh, important fundamental differences in the entrepreneurial culture in big business uh, between say america europe and india uh, especially given uh, a more salesmanship style that one often sees in old industries and in more american style uh, industries and the more engineering uh, more scientific approach that you've evinced tonight oh <coughs> well uh, I, i i'm not sure what what the question is but <laughs> don't ask but uh, let me say that i think uh, uh, india has a huge diversity in its its entrepreneurs and uh, uh, I, there are multiple reasons for that one is that historically uh, business in uh, you know because of the caste system business was an occupational caste in other words only some people did business and they were, they belonged to certain communities but what modernization has done is actually has made the barriers of entry to entrepreneurship drop so people who are not historically from a business background can get into business so people like me are, are not from a business background but we have got into business and i think therefore that combination of traditional businesses the new new people coming into business the the fact that we also have a large state owned business i think all this is is creating a very good cocktail now i know what you're saying i think indian business is less salesy or something um, yes but in all the all the industry I mean, perhaps i mean i i don't know i'm mean, saying they all stake and no sizzle here all right okay a uh, gentleman there thank you does the speaker agree that <laughs> that it might be too late by the time our political institutions come to age to reap our demographic and other uh, positive points which might be for the next 30 or 40 years and may it be time to leapfrog in our political arena as well well i think uh, you're right in saying there's a window of time and that that window of time could you know we could run out of time in that window because uh, you 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 know the the demographic dividend is not going to wait for anyone i mean that that's going to happen and what actually makes the demographic dividend even more scary is that when you actually unpeel the indian demographic dividend there are two curves there's one curve in the south and west of india and there's one in in central india and the bulk of the demographic dividend is in the is in the second region because already the populations in the south and the west have started to hit uh, replacement levels of fertility today for example if you look at the birth rate in kerala it's like a west european country and essentially the south and the west of india is going to start aging now and if you look at the births in the next 25 years only 12% of the births will be in south india 50% will be in six or seven states uttar pradesh bihar chatisgarh jharkhand orissa uh, and you know rajasthan and madhya pradesh so the and that's where also the political challenges are the most because of the his, so it it is definitely uh, you know it's a race against time because on the one hand you need to for the politics to improve you need a larger more enlightened more development focused middle class to change politics but if that doesn't happen in time then the politics will will be bad so i agree with you that there is a race against time but it's important for us to understand that there is this race against time and hopefully mobilize people to focus on these issues okay uh gentlemen there at the top yeah no no right here yeah, right here yeah. 
does the speaker agree that there's been a fundamental shift in attitude in terms of looking at India as just a business process outsourcing hub to a knowledge process outsourcing hub? No, no, I, th I think, uh, I don't think it was ever seen as a business process outsourcing hub because actually the, the IT and knowledge work out of India precedes the BPO business. I mean, the, you know, the IT business in India began in the 1960s and, and the BPO business began in the 1990s. So it's actually the 30 year history of that. So I think there's no question, if you look at the composition of revenues, you're talking about, you know, India today does about $50 billion of global uh, IT uh, and IT services. The bulk of that is, is knowledge activities, it's technology, it's high-end uh, technology transformation. So actually, it's very much now uh, a knowledge-based uh, uh, export business. Okay, uh, I'm surprised women are not asking questions. Uh, well, that one, this one there, yeah. I mean, I'm happy. Uh, Hi, Nathan, do you agree that uh, students sitting here, Indians, uh, Indian students and other Indians sitting here, the most important thing they need to do to ensure that India progresses? Uh, probably using your ideas, is to go back and engage seriously in politics, uh, probably contest elections. What do you make of uh, people doing that uh, in, in this election? Itself? No, I think uh, certainly uh, the more uh, well-educated and well-meaning people come into politics, I think that's, a, that's good news. And, and, and in fact, one of the things you will notice in this election is a remarkable number of people from non-traditional political backgrounds. So con contesting in, in, in our, my own city of Bangalore, Bangalore South, Captain Gopinath, who's actually an airline entrepreneur, is standing for election. Uh, in, in Shashi Tharoor, is standing in Trivandrum. There's the CEO of a bank who's standing in Bombay, Mira Sanyal. And, and there's Malika Sarabhai standing, who's a dancer, standing in, and so on. The many killer. So clearly, now, it's not clear to me how many of them will actually, you know, win. Mm. But I think this trend will, will, will continue. And uh, it'll take many years. And I think we, we must recognize that, I think, in, in Western democracies, it also took them hundreds of years to reach a full stage of democracy. In India, it's, it's, you know, it'll take time. So while I don't say everybody should go back and join politics, I think they may have to pay off the loans and all. I don't know what the challenges there are. Much more money to be made in politics. <laughs> no, they're not. He's going for something different. <laughs> Certainly, I think in the next 10, 15 years, I do hope more people will be there. The lady there. Yeah, right. No, no, no. On this side, this side. In, in, yeah. Um, with Rick. With regards to um, idea, your ideas on corruption, where would you place? Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with regards to your ideas on corruption, where would you place it in your categories? Ideas that have been accepted but not implemented, or is in challenges? And also, what are your ideas on this? See, I, I think uh, 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 I, I didn't want to promote corruption as an idea, <laughs> so I, I didn't. It's too late. Too late for that. I didn't have a chapter on that, but but I think you know I mean I, certainly it's it's a very uh, pernicious and uh, uh, you know uh, debilitating part of of India and and uh, I think uh, it it is something which will take time because uh, part of it is because of lack of good public services so you have to do something you know to, you have to pay money to get public services part of that has to be resource allocation part of that has to do with uh, you know lack of jobs. So I think there are a number of issues, and uh, it, it will take time to really get effectively sorted out. But ultimately, it will happen because there'll be more and more people who'll want a fair system, and they will demand that fair system. And the only stable equilibrium is a fair system. So that's how it's going to happen. And it's going to take time. It's not going to happen in a hurry. OK, uh, the gentleman here. The reason that do you agree? <laughs> the reason I consume 20 tons as an American is because I grew up following a very simplistic economic system of growth for its own sake, the, the consumer model of the fast car, the house, the lawn, etc. Do you, do you agree that you have such, you have a real advantage in India, the, the, the capital that you have is an intellectual capital, a spiritual capital. The, the, the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Buddha, the Gandhi, etc. Can you not take the lead and teach us something so that we look for more than just consumer goods and, and screw the environment and all goes to hell? Just stay well, uh, poor, man. Just, huh? just stay poor, you know. No, I think uh, certainly, well, I, I see that uh, uh, India has an opportunity to actually define what that thing is, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, how much of it is spiritual, I don't know that. But, <laughs> but, but fundamentally, I mean, there's no choice. As I said, if you're going to have 9 billion people on the planet, if, you're going to have, if you want to reach a steady state of 20 gigatons per year, you can't live this, this stuff. You can't do it the way we're doing it now. So, and India has a chance to, to do that because it doesn't have the infrastructure. It hasn't built the legacy. You know, it, it, it hasn't spent the money in, in creating a trillion dollar old economy infrastructure. So I think there's a chance, and plus of course about what, what, what is a better life? I mean, that, that question has to be answered. So I think definitely that's part of what India can do in, in the next 40, 50 years. Which is why I think it's not just about following that model of development, it's about rethinking the whole thing from ab initio and try to figure out what this new model of capitalism should be. The lady there in black, yeah. Hi. I just wanted to ask you, uh, you know, 60% of India's population is still in rural India and they don't have the same kind of opportunities that a person in the city would have. Now, what can an Indian homegrown company such as an Infosys or a TCS do to ensure that even rural India benefits from globalization and, you know, is not left behind facing the financial crisis? So what can you do to ensure that even now, even in this state, Rural India is not left behind because if they are left behind, India will probably be left behind. No, I think there. I mean, it's, there's no simple answer to that. I think part of it is obviously improving rural farm productivity, so there's more income in the hands of farmers. Part of it is taking surplus people out of the rural economy and getting them jobs in industrial economy in cities. Part of it is better supply chain so that you're able to reduce the wastage of agricultural product so that there's no more money for the consumer, there's more money for the farmer and at the same time lower prices for the consumer. I mean, there's, there's no one quick fix to that. My, my question was, what is the IT industry? I, yeah, no, I think it's happening. For example, if you look at financial inclusion today, uh, financial inclusion Every bank is trying to is trying to uh, increase its penetration. Today, there are only about 200 million bank accounts, so most people are outside the formal financial system. But technology is now making it possible to have, with low transaction cost and with with broadband connectivity and wireless, is able to offer accounts, banking accounts, to people who could never have it earlier. So every one of us is now working with the banks to launch products, using, including using offline biometric cards which allow you to extend banking services to the poor. Microfinance today, which is happening, a lot of that is technology-based. There's a lot of work happening in health diagnostics, which allows you to have relatively lower skilled people providing high quality medical diagnostics over a network. So the umpteen number of things that are happening with technology right now on an experimental basis, in some cases, they're actually getting rolled out in a big way. Okay, the gentleman there in black. Hmm? Sir? Sir, do you agree that, uh, you, you know, uh, I was just flipping on the pages, it says uh, notes from an accidental entrepreneur and, you know, even Mr. Murthy started off with Putney Computers initially. So, uh, and majority of us being, you know, in mid-twenties, early twenties, uh, studying at LSE, do you, do you agree that the only way we can succeed in India is, buying more, is, is by being more entrepreneurial? And uh, what, is, what is the one piece of advice that you will give to all the youngsters here? Well, some of you want to be politicians and some of you want to be entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think to me, uh, uh, I think it's great if somebody wants to be an entrepreneur. And uh, I, th I think to me, entrepreneurship is, is, at the end of the day, it's about deferred gratification. Because if, if you're going to get into entrepreneurship expecting rewards tomorrow morning, then you shouldn't even try. Because it, there is, it takes a long time and there are a lot of heartbreaks, there's a lot of adversity. You, ha you have to have the will and the, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And therefore, if you have that and you have a vision of the kind of company you want to create, then you should be an entrepreneur. But don't do it because you're going to make a million bucks tomorrow morning. Uh, lady here, green, green. yeah. Thank you. Um, so do you agree that all technology oh. is not good? What do you think about the cotton farmers um, committing suicide every seven minutes in India? Because of the genetically modified seeds? Actually, uh, I, I, I'm not sure about that argument no, because I've no. talked to many people. I've talked to a researcher at the University of Washington who's been studying this, and she actually sh says the opposite to me, that, that actually BT cotton is helping. So it's not clear to me that whether that data is correct. Uh, but I agree with you in general that we have to be very careful about the role of technology. And 
you know, the same technology which allows us to do IT can also be abused on privacy matters and so on. So every technology has, has a good and a bad side to it. So we have to be very careful. But on balance, if you look at the large problems that India has, if, if we want to bring transformation to a billion people in a matter of a few years, you can't do it without some step function. You can't do it the old way. Oh, wow. Uh, gentleman here? Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, the lady that had to hand for a long time. Yeah, please. <laughs> Hello, you refer to reservation in your talk. So, do you agree with the reservation policy floated with the government? Or if not, or if you do, what do you propose as far as the reservation goes? Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, reservations has become a political minefield in India. And a lot of it stems from not addressing some structural issues. Because you let's take the IITs. Okay, 400,000 children appear for the IIT entrance exam for 4,000 seats. Many of them spend years in some boot camp in some Kota or Patna or somewhere to get into IITs. The latest report says they're going to start these boot camps in the sixth standard to get into IIT. I mean, this has gone crazy. And what has happened, therefore, is because we have not bothered to reform and expand access in education, we're creating this huge Darwinian system. And then the soft option politically to address the issue of social exclusion is to say, okay, there are 4,000 seats, so we'll lose out 2,000 of them for this caste or that caste, which is a very wrong way to go. The real way to go is to A, expand those 4,000 seats to 40,000 seats, so 400,000 seats. And then th th there's no shortage. Then the, what is the, you can reserve as much as you want, but it doesn't make, make a difference. So I think because of the shortcuts we have chosen, it, it's been a very pernicious system. So the real, I believe the real thing is to, is to expand capacity dramatically, allow private universities, allow foreign universities, let anybody do that subject to quality and all that, and, and provide a whole host of affirmative action programs so that people from socially excluded backgrounds get a chance to have an education. And these are all shortcuts and political uh, instruments. And essentially, it's a battle of middle class elites. It's middle class backwards against middle class forwards. It's nothing to do with the poor. The poor have nothing. That poor kid in Bihar who's, who's not got education, he, he, it doesn't matter if there's reservation IIT or not for him. So I think it's, it's a very pernicious uh, and uh, uh, convoluted and sort of perverted way of addressing social exclusion. Gentlemen back there. I think the only thing I found um, cha um, difficult to sort of resolve after having read the book is, is this vision you propose of a new paradigm. I mean, I'm, tr I'm struggling to think that, you know, Gandhi had one approach, Nehru had a diametrically opposed approach, perhaps Vallabhai Patel sat in the middle. We are where we are now, but what is the new paradigm? I, you know, I, I guess that's the one weakness I'm struggling with and what is otherwise an excellent and a fantastic book. Uh, well, I think, you know, I, I, I didn't want to be too prescriptive in saying this is the new paradigm because I think my, my purpose in this book is to, is to get people to start thinking and, and understand that there's this strategic opportunity that India has and then hopefully evolve solutions from that. But I think, I think one thing is very clear that we have to address the challenge of uh, our population and poverty, I think, that, uh, and, and build a less, in, less inequitable society. That's very clear. At the same time, when we talk about the challenge of environment and energy and all that, it'll have to be a different way of, of, of addressing that. It's not, it's not about going and buying more things. So I think that paradigm, which I don't know what it is, but it'll have to come somewhere in this. That is, we address the challenge of poverty and population and give people a better quality of life. At the same time, you do it in a way that you don't have the impacts, negative impacts of that on the economy and the ecology. And somewhere in that is the space. Now, I didn't want to be the guy saying this is it, but I think it's, this is really to provoke uh, people to think about this in a more strategic manner. Sure. Okay. Uh, gentlemen here. Are, they, are you all getting very good exercise? I think by having your hands. And, and that, that's why I'm not discouraging you. Uh, how long do you think it will be in India before children, all children, have education, i.e. compulsory education, from primary school right up to 15 or 16, I mean, let alone being trained beyond that? But, uh, what, what is your estimate, please? Well, 
I, I think, I mean, this is a gut feel, but I think we'll have 90% literacy by 2020. Because it'll happen not necessarily because of the a law was passed. It'll happen because people have figured out that this is important. And parents today, the poor, are willing to sacrifice a significant part of their current income to put their children in private schools because they feel the public schools are not functioning. Or the public schools will improve as the money spent delivers more results. You know, but in that whole... Uh, chaos, I think uh, you will see, uh, as it is, enrollments have gone up. At the same time, quality of outcomes has not gone up. So, you know, but at least the kids are now coming into school. The next step is to improve the outcomes. I think in the next 10, 12, 10, 12 years, you'll see significant improvements in literacy. How, how many more do you think? Uh, I whatever, Ruth. I'm fine. I think I'm going to uh, One over there at the back. Hi. I have to um, help people who are sitting in. What lessons, if any, can India take from China's economic expansion, and what lessons have you learnt yourself from dealing with Chinese entrepreneurs? Sounds like a term paper to me. Yeah. Sounds like, <laughs> like it's term paper. <laughs> trying, trying to save some time, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think clearly uh, the way China is able to implement both scale and speed is, is something that's extraordinary, right? I mean, the way they're able to build new roads or build new airports or or move 100 million people from you know villages to cities so the scale and oper uh, building 100 iit like institutions so that's something which india is not capable of doing uh, at the same time i think uh, the uh, china for example today i think faces certain challenges it, a, the challenge of aging i think uh, what has happened i was told i was talking to a demographer friend of mine and he said that when they did this one child policy this policy was actually developed by a bunch of aeronautical engineers who did a spreadsheet and said, my God, this population is going to grow to 2 billion, so if you put in this one child in some spreadsheet, the population will you know, maybe stabilize at 1.5 billion, and that's how they went. But what has happened, and this is uh, the classic situation of the unintended consequences of large social engineering, is it's creating a whole host of issues. They got the short-term bump of, of the demographic dividend, rapid aging, 400 million uh, old people, huge pension costs. They don't have a pension system to pay for that. Uh, childhood obesity, because you have one child, you, you, know, you give them chocolates and ice cream and all this stuff. <laughs> Highly individualistic behavior, because you haven't grown up with a sibling. And you know, this whole one is to four thing, you know, one child, four grandparents kind of thing. So it's, it's actually created a lot of very unex... And of course, uh, female infanticide, because you, know, you have one child, you want to have a males, so all that stuff. So fundamentally, this social engineering on that scale causes huge unintended consequences. So I think in Indian case, while we haven't done many things very well, because of the general inertia in the system, also something that, that could have done which had major negative consequences also has not happened. The other thing is that I think India has a much more domestic economy. Uh, Two-thirds of the Indian economy is con in domestic consumer spending. In China, it's one-third. So I think they will have to now, with what's happening in the world, will have to re reorient it towards much more of a domestic economy. So I think, I think we have a lot to learn on implementation scale, but I think on some issues, India is better off. Okay, the lady here. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I was very pleased to hear that uh, you said they're at least thinking about uh, implementing a single market in India. Um, I'd like to ask you what, about what might seem to be a, a relatively minor detail, but perhaps it indicates a mindset. Um, regarding primary education, when I see schools, um, informal schools or NGO-run schools for children in the slums, or for the state schools, government schools, um, also teaching these kind of children, I find that they are learning Sanskrit. And I feel, although I learned Latin myself and was very pleased about it, we don't teach Latin now. And it does seem to me that there are so many other things that I just wish these children could be learning in the time available, you know, more science and technology okay, yeah, and yeah, so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, what do you uh, think? Yeah, no, I'd like to visit this school where they're teaching Sanskrit. Exactly. <laughs> where are they? Where are they? In Boris Delhi. would like that. Boris Johnson would like that very much. <laughs> Boris Johnson would like that very much. Well, I'm, I, I actually, I'm not aware, and you know, my wife Rohini does a lot of work in this sector, and she also is shaking her head. So I don't know where this is happening, but 
if it's happening, obviously I agree with you. I think they should be learning more germane things. But I think on the single market, actually, there's a lot of progress. I think, for example, uh, India went from a sales tax system to a VAT system. And in fact, now we have a national VAT system. Mm -hmm. And uh, by 2010, they're going to implement something called GST, goods and services tax, which will integrate both the manufacturing tax and the sales tax into one tax system. So all those will have significant impact on creating a national market. OK, gentlemen there, on the edge. Yeah, gentlemen here, yeah. Stop by before it made. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hi. Um, would you agree that in terms of migration trends that the Indian economic boom has actually slowed down the so-called brain drain of professionals leaving India to pursue their careers elsewhere? And in fact, do you think there's any evidence of non-resident Indians and uh, people of Indian origin now returning to India to invest and work? Sure. So certainly I think uh, as the economic opportunity in India go up and, and they, you know, there are challenges uh, in the West, you will have more movement backwards. But I think even if it, it doesn't really matter. I think, I, think, I think the difference is when India was uh, sort of not in favor of globalization, then because you ran a closed economy, then anybody who crossed that left the system. So that was when it was a brain drain kind of thing. But when India becomes pro-globalization, then everywhere in the world, it doesn't matter who, where the person is, and therefore it becomes brain gain. For example, already if you look at remittances, India is the number one country for remittances by Indians from outside into India. It's about $30 billion a year. So, you know, Indians can contribute wherever they are to the economy in terms of money, in terms of intellectual capital, in terms of brand building, in terms of entrepreneurship. So it's, it's all okay. They can be wherever they want. Uh, okay, uh, lady here in the middle. Yeah. Do you agree that uh, vocational education is a part of the How boring. Is, is what we need because although I don't like to parent English China because we have completely different political and the way that government works and our government works, I mean, there's so much support, so there's so much for us. But my point is that vocational education is good, okay? Is it good? <laughs> no, no, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's a big thing, so. Okay, thank you. No, no, I, 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 he agrees with you. Uh, now, I'm going to have to bring this thing to a close because Nandan has been amazingly patient and he has now been answering questions for half an hour uh, and he has answered lots of questions with great patience. I have to tell you that if you want his book signed, you buy the books outside and you come in here from an orderly queue and then he'll sign it. Uh, and. Uh, all it remains for me to say is that it's been a great feast of ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Both Thank for you. And thanks, Danny Kwa, uh, for his discussion.